Let me uh, focus your attention this morning on Matthew. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 26 and the Gospel of John chapter 21. This is um, the final week of this particular sermon series that I began six weeks ago entitled Pictures of Grace, and I wanted to conclude uh, with a look at the relationship between Jesus and his disciple Peter. I think it is a remarkable picture of grace when we examine more closely that relationship. Okay, Matthew chapter 26, I want to look at verses 30 through 35 first. Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. And then down, same chapter, beginning in verse 69, Matthew 26, 69. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. And then flip over to John The Gospel of John, chapter 21. John, chapter 21, verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. May God add His rich blessing and help us to understand this rich portion of His Word. In the movie, The Happening, which is not necessarily a movie that you may be familiar with, writer, producer, director, M. Night Shyamalan unfolds this freaky plot about a mysterious, invisible toxin that causes anyone exposed to it to commit suicide. And one of the first signs that the unaware victim has breathed in this self-destructing toxin is that they begin walking backwards. It's a pretty freaky movie. Signaling that every natural instinct to go on living and to fight for survival has been reversed. The victim's default survival mechanism is turned upside down. Now the reason that comes to mind is because as I was thinking about it, this is in a sense exactly what needs to happen to us when it comes to the way we think about life. 
Because when breathed in, the radical, unconditional, free grace of God reverses every natural instinct regarding what makes sense. Only the toxin of God's grace can reverse the way that we typically think about life and God and relationships. There is nothing, as I've said over the course of this series, there is nothing more difficult for our minds to get around and our hearts to grasp than the grace of God. Nothing. It offends our deepest sensibilities. It turns everything upside down. It offends everything that seems to make sense to us naturally. It wrecks us. And I've said from the very beginning of this series that because of that reality, what we need most is to be shocked, surprised by God's grace so that it has the deep impact on all of us that God intends for it to have. So my, my hope and my prayer throughout this series has been that this series would be a shock to our system. I, I've, I said last week and I said the week before that if grace doesn't cause you to say, wait a minute, that can't be right, then it's not biblical grace that you and I have encountered. It's that shocking. It's that counterintuitive. It's that wrecking. It turns everything that makes sense in our conditional world upside down. The very notion of unconditionality as it concerns God's extension of grace to sinners like you and me doesn't make sense to us because everything in our world is conditional. Everything. So much work for me gets so much blessing from you. And we take that into our relationship with God. And as a result of operating with God conditionally and thinking at some level that God operates with us conditionally, we miss out on the radical nature of the gospel and the impact that it can have in our lives in the context of our relationships. And so I'm hoping and praying at some level that this series has been a shock to our system, that it is, that it has in a sense made you mad. Okay, I've told you before, the seminary professor of mine when I was in school who said, if you want to make people mad, preach the law. If you want to make people furious, preach grace. It's offensive. The Apostle Paul calls it a stumbling block because it takes us and what we do out of the center of the picture and it replaces us with Jesus. And so my hope and my prayer is that we will read the entirety of Scripture through the lens of God's gospel of grace and that we will come to see that the gospel is not simply something that we need before God saves us, but it's something that we desperately need after God saves us. That the gospel doesn't just get us in, the gospel keeps us in. That because we remain daily sinners until we die, we need daily distributions of God's grace. And I wanted to close out this series by looking at Jesus' relationship to Peter. Now, let me just stop there because I forgot to tell you something. When I come back, some have asked, what are we going to do? What are you going to preach when you come back? The first thing I'm going to do when I come back is I'm going to spend two weeks, basically, as I do every time I come back from vacation in the summer, basically sharing with you uh, where we've been, where we are, and where we're headed. There are two times during the course of the year, right after Christmas and right after summer, where I basically explain once again who we are and what we're doing and where we're going just to reorient all of our hearts and minds around the mission of this church. And then once that's finished and everybody should be back in town for 
school getting ready to start. I'm going to begin a series that I'm trying to get my mind around right now, so pray for me while I'm away. I'll be doing a lot of reading and studying while I'm away on the book of Ecclesiastes. I'm not sure what the title of the sermon series is going to be, but I am going to study Ecclesiastes and preach through the book of Ecclesiastes beginning mid-August, and I'm not sure how long it will go, but pray that God will give me help and insight. It's not the easiest book to understand. So that's where we're going. Okay, parenthesis is over. Let's get back to the sermon. Um, it's easy as I was looking at this relationship, the relationship between Jesus and Peter this week, it's very easy to put Peter in a box. I mean, he was the disciple who was very impulsive, who talked a big game. Every time he opened his mouth, he was demonstrating just how radically committed to Jesus he was. Okay, he wasn't shy about expressing his devotion to Christ. He, he was a guy who would get really high and then he would get really low. And it's easy to put him in a box and think about him as the guy who was always sticking his foot in his mouth. That he had a tremendous amount of zeal, but he had very little knowledge. He was always getting out in front of himself, and Jesus would always gently and sometimes not so gently rebuke him and pull him back and call him to order and all of these things. But it's easy to put Peter in a box as being that guy, you know? But lest we think that we're nothing like Peter, the more I think about him and the more I investigated his relationship to Jesus, the more convinced I became that his life and relationship with Jesus is really a miniature of all of our Christian experience. That if you want to know something about the rhythm of the Christian life, if you want to know something about our sin and God's grace, an investigation of Peter and his relationship to Jesus is a remarkable place to begin. Because Peter's life and relationship to Jesus really does provide us a snapshot of the Christian life. Our highs, our lows, the mistakes we typically make, the way Jesus approaches us and the things we typically depend on in our relationship to Jesus. So I want to look at two things as we scan the passages that I read this morning. I want to look at two things briefly that I think are absolutely crucial, crucial to our understanding. If I go away on vacation and die, now listen, I know that sounds terrible. I might though, okay. Um, I know Kim's going to say, why do you always say that kind of stuff? It's so morbid. Well, I'm just being realistic. This is the last sermon that I will have preached, okay, to you. And as I was thinking about that, I fully expect to come back alive and well and rested, okay? I'm just saying um, that this would be the last thing I would want to say. Okay, so as I was thinking about the fact that I'm going to be leaving you, my family, for a few weeks, I thought about what, what's the last thing I would want to say before we all go our separate ways this summer? What is it that I want us to spend the rest of, not only this summer, but the rest of our lives thinking about, meditating on? And this is it. Two things we see in this narrative. The first thing is simply, our love fails. And the second thing is simply, God's love succeeds. That is seen so clearly in this narrative and it is my hope and my prayer that these two realities, these two stark realities will be grasped by us and will drive the way we think about God and ourselves and other people. So first, our love fails. Peter never had a problem voicing his devotion to Jesus, ever. He loved Jesus, understandably so. Here he was, a lowly fisherman. And Jesus comes along and calls him and summons Peter to follow him. And Peter 
puts his nets down. Jesus promises that from this point forward, they will become fishers of men. He will become a fisher of men. And Peter willingly lays his nets aside and he follows Jesus. And for the next three years, Jesus invests the best of what he has into Peter. He takes him under his wing. He mentors him. He invests in him. He loves him well. And so it's understandable that Peter would want to express just how much he loved Jesus. He never had a problem, whether it was publicly or privately, he never had an issue with declaring his affection for Christ. He wanted everybody to know just how much he loved Jesus. Peter was confident that his devotion to Jesus would see him through the difficult times. Okay, this is what we begin to see here in this narrative. Jesus loves Peter. Peter loves Jesus. They were good friends. You can just imagine how much of their life together is not recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All of the conversations, we have a great sampling of the conversations they had and the ministry that they had and the way Jesus ministered to Peter specifically, but there were tons of conversations, a lot of laughter. They lived life together. They were friends. They were close. And because Peter was confident in his affection for Jesus, he really did believe that it was his commitment to Christ, his devotion to Christ that would see him through, that would get him to the finish line. He was convinced that it was his love for Jesus that would carry the day. And so we go to Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 30, and here they are having one final conversation before Jesus goes to the cross. And verse 30 begins by saying, when they had sung a hymn. Now, it would be very easy to just read past that, brush past that. Why does Matthew mention that they sang a hymn? I mean, it seems irrelevant. But most Bible scholars are certain that they sang the last great Hallel. What is that? Well, it's a series of psalms culminating in Psalm 136. And the word Hallel is simply a Hebrew word that means a joyous praise in song and comes from the same root word as the phrase hallelujah, which literally means praise God. And if you think through what Psalm 136 says, the driving theme, go back and look at it later, the driving theme of Psalm 136 is the steadfast love of God. Psalm 136 is 26 verses long and 26 times it says his, meaning God's, steadfast love endures forever. In every season of life, when things are going well, when things are not going well, when you're happy, when you're sad, when people are for you, when people are against you, in everything, through everything, it is the steadfast love of the Lord that endures forever. So here they are, beginning this one final conversation, Jesus intentionally getting them to sing this song that will drive home even more deeply what is about to happen that it is the steadfast love of God that endures forever. He wanted them to know something about what it is that endures forever. He wanted them to know something about whose love was steadfast, whose love alone is unwavering and unflinching. Before he goes to the cross, Jesus wants to drive home to all his disciples that it is his love for them and not their love for him that endures forever. Now, Peter, 
apparently has a difficult time with this. For understandable reasons, as I mentioned, he has a tremendous amount of love for Jesus because of the way Jesus has called him and invested in him and befriended him and ministered to him. But Peter doesn't like the thought that his love for Jesus won't endure forever. He doesn't like the fact that Jesus is essentially saying, it is my love for you, not your love for me, that will see you through. And his refusal to accept this, wanting to bank instead on his love for Jesus, is seen so clearly when he says, so clearly when Jesus says, you're all going to fall away. And Peter says, they might, but I won't. Their love for you might be flimsy, but mine isn't. My love for you is sturdy. And if it comes down to it, I will go to my death with you. That's how strong my love is for you. I, Peter is saying, I will die for you. Peter, whether he was conscious of it or not, was banking on his devotion to Jesus, his commitment to Jesus, his love for Jesus. He had located strength and sustenance in his love for Christ. Sounds admirable and sweet. I mean, sounds a lot like us. <laughs> sounds like a lot like me, like you. I mean, we, we are grateful for our salvation if we are Christians and we determine that we will now demonstrate to the whole world just how strong and how unwavering and how steadfast our love for God is. And as we looked at last week, it's when we start trusting in ourselves, self-righteousness begins brewing. And when self-righteousness begins brewing, we begin to hold other people in contempt. Peter says it here. They might fall away, but I won't. My love for you is stronger, is stronger than theirs. There are a lot of people inside the church who get frustrated with a lot of other people inside the church because at some level they've concluded that their love for God is stronger than the other person's love for God. If their love for God was as strong as our love for God, they would be devoting themselves to God the way I'm devoting myself to God. And what becomes the driving theme of our life, the engine that propels us forward? It's no longer Christ's unconditional, untamable love for us. It's our unwavering love for Him. And even after Jesus says, Peter, Peter, um, before the night's over, you're going to be the one who fails most miserably. They'll all scatter and they'll run. But you're going to verbally deny me three times. And Peter says, you got the wrong guy, not me. You have obviously underestimated the depth of my devotion to you. I will die for you. It's amazing. Right before Jesus goes to the cross to demonstrate his unimaginable love for sinners like you and me, so that the driving force that turns everything on its head is the death of Christ, Peter says, I will die for you. And Jesus demonstrates only a few hours later, this whole thing is about my death for you, not your death for me. It's an amazing turn of events, a remarkable turn of events. We think oftentimes um, that our heart devotion to God is what matters most. 
That is, it is our heart devotion to God that will drive us, that will sustain us. And the sad thing about that is we become proud. When the Christian life becomes about our heart devotion to God and the strength of our commitment to God instead of Christ's heart devotion to us and Christ's commitment to us, we become proud. And it becomes, as I said a minute ago, the fuel which causes us to look down our nose at other people. You need to be as radical as me. You need to be as committed as me. And we start evaluating other people's spiritual well-being based on just how sacrificial they are. And now what becomes the center of the Christian life? Jesus and his sacrifice is replaced as the hub by our sacrifice. We are so terribly narcissistic. We really are. It's amazing how subtle this is. It really is. And the thing is, we grow up, for the most part, believing, if you grew up in church, believing that this whole thing is about my love for Jesus. This whole thing is about my commitment to Jesus. That's what it's about. We talk so much more about our commitment to Jesus than we do his to us. It's unbelievable. Books upon books upon books are written. Christian books that are nothing more than baptized self-help manuals trying to put at the center of this story your commitment to Jesus. Well, we're going to find out here in a minute. Uh, we're going to find out here in a minute that your commitment to Jesus and mine is way weaker and more flimsy than we think it is. If you want to bank. If you want to make sure that you make it to the finish line and you think it's your devotion to Jesus that will get you there, you're in trouble, as Peter found out. In his book, which I highly recommend, The Gospel Mystery of Sanctification, Walter Marshall succinctly puts his finger on what our default mode is and how it can rob us of the joy of our salvation. Listen to what he says. By nature, you are completely, this is all of you now, okay? Me too. By nature, you are completely addicted to a legal method of salvation. Even after you become a Christian by believing the gospel, your heart is still addicted to salvation by works. In your heart, you still want the duty of what you should do to come before the comforts of what Jesus has done. You find it so hard to believe that you should get any blessing before you work for it. So this is the mindset that we tend to fall into. We sincerely want to obey the laws of God. Therefore, to make sure you obey the law of God, you make all of God's blessings depend upon how well you keep his law. Some preachers even tell you that you had better not enjoy the blessings of the gospel. They tell you to diligently obey the law first and that only by doing this will you be safe and happy before God. Just keep in mind, however, he says, that if you go this route, you will never enjoy your salvation for as long as you live in this world. In other words... If the driver in your life and mine becomes our obedience for Jesus, instead of it being first Christ's obedience for us, we'll become miserable, proud, burdened. If this whole thing is riding on my obedience, we're in trouble. If this whole thing is riding on your obedience, we're in trouble. Thankfully, what Paul says in Romans 7, if this whole thing were if this whole thing were riding on me, we'd all be in trouble. And then he says, thank God for Jesus. This is about Him. It's about what He has done. His love for us. His devotion to us. His commitment to us. He's the hero of the story. It's all about Him. And when we drink deeply from the well of Christ's finished work, it is then and only then that we begin to change, that we're transformed. Well, okay, back to the story. So what happens next? Well, 
Peter's love fails miserably. He goes from saying, I'll never deny you, ever. You have underestimated my love for you, Jesus. It will see me through and it will, I'll die for you. It will push me to the brink of death for you. I can't wait to show you how committed I am to you. You're going to be so proud of my commitment to you. Sounds so much like people inside the church. What happens? Same things that happen, the same thing that happens to all of us when what we bank on first is our devotion to Jesus instead of his to us. He fails miserably. Miserably. He runs out of gas. He conks out. Just like Jesus said, Peter denies him three times. Notice, first, he denies that he was with Jesus in verses 69 and 70. I wasn't with him. And his denials intensify. Then he denies that he even knows him. Verse 72. And then he curses and swears that he doesn't know him. Now we're talking just a couple hours earlier. He's saying, I'll die for you. A few hours later, he does exactly what Jesus said he was going to do. Three times. He denies him twice to a little girl. A girl! Okay. It's probably 12, 13 years old. Mister, were you with him? I wasn't! Remember what I said. This is a snapshot of how flimsy all of our love is for Jesus. Well, Luke 22, verse 61 adds, after Peter denies Jesus three times and the rooster crows, it says in Luke twenty-two sixty-one, 61, it adds this line, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. I just, I can't imagine what that must have been like. I can't imagine when Jesus heard the rooster go off three times, and he turned and looked at Je- and he turned and looked when Jesus turned and looked at Peter. I just can't imagine what that eye contact must have felt like. Peter becoming acutely aware that he has absolutely blown it. His pride came before his fall. What he was banking on, namely his love for Jesus, bottomed out. And that eye contact that takes place, this is real. This is, it's hard for us to imagine because we've never looked into the physical eyes of Jesus. We will. But you and I haven't. Peter did. This is the second person of the Trinity. Fully God, fully man. Turns and looks at Peter. And Peter absolutely undone, in absolute brokenness, the Bible tells us. He realizes the weakness. He becomes aware of the weakness of his love for Jesus. And he runs out. And the Bible says he wept bitterly. Undone. Coming to terms with the fact that his love for Jesus is genuinely shallow. That his commitment to Christ is weak. That in reality, his devotion to Jesus was not all that it was cracked up to be in his own mind. Listen, this is what it boils down to for us, okay? Are we upheld by our commitment to Jesus or his commitment to us? Whose love endures forever? Yours or God's? It can't be both. Whose love endures forever, yours or God's? The reason those questions are so important is because your answer to these questions will determine the whole direction of your Christian life. It will either show that you think the Christian life is about what you do for God, or it will show that you think the Christian life is about what God did for you. One of those two things is driving you today if you're a Christian. 
what drives you today, consciously or unconsciously, is either the idea that the Christian life is all about what I do for God, or the Christian life is about what God has done for me. I love what Martin Luther said. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is tested. Now, putting that in the context of what I'm saying, where the battle rages, there it will show what you are depending on ultimately to endure and to see you through. When it really comes down to it, do you want to bank on your love for Jesus? When it really, when, I mean, when the, when the rubber meets the road, do you really want to believe that what gets you through is your radical devotion to Jesus? Because it ain't that radical. It's not. No matter what you think, no matter how you deceive yourself, no matter how sacrificial you are, no matter how dirty your hands are in service to other people, it's not that radical, especially in comparison to Christ's radical love for you. So, what are you going to bank on at the end of the day? When you put your head down on your pillow, what are you wanting to rest in? Is it your devotion to Jesus? Is that going to be what sees you through and gets you to the finish line? Or is it His love for you? The focus of the Bible. Okay, this is... This sentence, I'm hoping, will help you read the entire Bible. Okay, if I could put my exhortation to you in one sentence regarding how to read the Bible, the whole Bible. I'm talking Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Psalms, Micah, okay, the whole Bible. It's super important to remember that the focus of the Bible is not the love and life of the redeemed, but the love and life of the Redeemer. Big difference. We read the Bible as if it is some spiritual fortune cookie that we go to and say, you know, it's what we call lucky dipping. You know, I need a word from the Lord today. The backslider in heart will be filled with the fruit of his ways. Okay? I mean, we really approach the Bible as if it's all about, you know, teaching us to live a good life. And we forget that this isn't some big, giant, spiritual fortune cookie from heaven. Okay, this is God's revelation, His unfolding revelation regarding His promise to clean up our mess. And who does it? I've said, the Bible tells one story and it points to one figure. It tells the story of Christ. It tells the story of God cleaning up our mess and it points to Christ as the one who does it. So I love what Tim Keller says. The Bible is not fundamentally about us. It's fundamentally about Jesus. The Bible's purpose is not so much to show you how to live a good life. The Bible's purpose is to consistently and constantly show you how God's grace breaks into your life against your will and saves you from the sin and brokenness that you would never be able to overcome otherwise. I'm going to say that again. So important for us to understand what this is all about. He says the Bible is not fundamentally about us. It's fundamentally about Jesus. The Bible's purpose is not so much to show you how to live a good life. The Bible's purpose is to consistently and constantly show you how God's grace breaks into your life against your will and saves you from the sin and brokenness that you would never be able to overcome otherwise. So what's that mean? Well, if we determine that the Christian life can be fueled by our love for God, like Peter, we will fail miserably. It's not about us. There has to be something greater, something brighter, something sturdier that drives us than our love for God. Well, what is it? Point two. If our love fails, God's love succeeds. I love this part. 
Fast forward to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. The disciples come back from fishing early one morning and the resurrected Jesus. Jesus has already now died and been resurrected. And it's that time before he ascends back to the Father. The resurrected Jesus is waiting for them on the beach, cooking breakfast. Okay, An intimate moment between Jesus and some of his disciples. And it says, beginning in verse 15, And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Then tend my sheep. Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And Peter said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. What a grueling experience for Peter. Think about it for a moment. I mean, it almost seems like Jesus is rubbing salt in the wound. He's rubbing Peter's failures in his face, reminding him of his failing love for Jesus. But Jesus is doing something so remarkably gracious for Peter here, unbelievably gracious. In light of Peter's failing love for Jesus, And in contrast to Peter's failing love for Jesus, a failing love that Peter felt miserable about. Can you imagine the misery? Not being able to sleep at night, reflecting on all that this man had done for me, and when given the opportunity, I blew it. I blew it. And how difficult it must have been for him day after day, night after night, the guilt in his conscience. How humbled he must have been. How sad he must have been. At how he radically disappointed his Savior. And Jesus does something remarkably gracious for Peter to demonstrate that while your love fails, My love always succeeds. He he restores him. And he gives him work to do. It's like when we studied Jonah when I first got here two years ago. You know, the story's not so much about God going after Nineveh. The story's about God going after Jonah. I mean, Jesus himself said when the Pharisees were telling him to get the people to stop singing during his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And they said, tell your people to stop singing. And Jesus said, if they stop, the stones themselves will cry out. Jesus didn't need Peter. God didn't need Jonah. It's an amazing thing that not only here does Christ's overflowing love restore Peter. His love meets Peter's failure three times. And it's that love that restores Peter and fuels the work that Jesus commissions him to do. Jesus recommissions Peter three times, just as Peter had denied Jesus three times. And what's so remarkable about that is that Jesus' commitment to us matches and ultimately overpowers our failures. Now that's something to bank on. In fact, his love is so great that he even works through us commissioning Peter after Peter's love fails miserably. Human wisdom, the wisdom of this world, 
has no system or plan for dealing with the mistakes of yesterday. None. What does the wisdom of this world have to say to you and me? In the darkness of night, when we are feeling overwhelmed and guilty about yesterday's failures. What does the wisdom of this world have to say? What does human wisdom have to do? What does it give us in light of our failures, our weaknesses, our guiltiness? All that it can do is hand us over to the assaults of conscience or when our conscience is seared to dreary deadness and dullness. That's what this world has to offer you in terms of yesterday's failures and the guilt that you have. But what is not possible with man is possible with God. God fits our sordid past and embarrassing failures into his grand plan. Here we find the enthusiasm, the hope, and the joy of the Christian faith. It is God's love for us that has something to say in the face of our failure. It is God's love alone that is restorative and reconciling. In the mystery of his cross, God neutralizes the effects of sin, forgives its offense, blots out its stain, expiates its guilt, and creates a new beginning. And this is what he did for Peter when he said to him, feed my sheep. What qualifies you for service, Peter, is not your love for me. It's my love for you. What qualifies you for ministry, the high and holy task of feeding my sheep, is my devotion to you. It is my devotion to you that animates effectiveness, not your devotion to me. We've already seen how strong your devotion to me is. So if you're going to bank on something, anything, Bank not on your love for me, but my love for you. Because your love for me will fail. It'll fail again. His perfect love upholds us despite the fact that our love is imperfect. And the reason this is so important is because we often rest our Christianity on the crumbling foundation of our own devotion. In fact, even if you listen to the way we talk about the Christian faith, we characterize faith in Christ by the commitment we made to Him instead of the commitment that God made to us. Even the verbiage we use demonstrates that this whole thing began when I made my commitment to Christ. We love Him, John says, because He first loved us. If you're a Christian, it did not begin with your commitment to Christ. It began with Christ's commitment to you. It is Christ's commitment to you. It is his work for you that made you alive and caused you to commit yourself to him and to run to him. Listen, okay? I'm just going to this is as plain as I can say it. This whole thing rests on God's infinite, incomprehensible, unconditional love for us. This whole thing. Not your love for him. Peter was so relieved to know that his relationship to God was dependent on Christ's devotion to him and not his devotion to Christ. So relieved. Just huge exhale. He saw where his devotion to Christ led him. And he's so relieved now as he comes to terms with the fact that this whole thing is about Jesus' love for me. That's the driver. That's the thing that will never fail. That's the love that endures forever. Not mine. Even after Christ pours out his love, 
our hearts still resist and choose to believe that we are upheld by our steadfast love, not Christ's. You'd like to think, for instance, that after this episode on the beach, Peter gets it forever. Okay, There's this aha moment that takes place in his life, and he gets it forever. And it, in some ironic way, reinforces his commitment to Jesus. Well, Peter, if you know the rest of the story, follows this same pattern again. I mean, in Galatians, for instance, Paul calls Peter out. The apostle Paul does. Why? For being a wimp again. Okay, he, he was refusing to associate with Gentile believers for fear of what the Judaizers might think of him. In a sense, he denies Christ again. <laughs> and Paul calls him out. This is after this glorious episode on the beach, this restoring, recommissioning of Peter from Jesus. This is after it. Why is that so encouraging to me? <laughs> and should be for you too. Because you'll continue to fail. You'll continue to blow it. So will I. Our heart's devotion to Christ will never be what Christ's devotion to us is. And so I look at the life of Peter and I think, here's a man called by God, friends with Jesus. And as he develops his love and affection for Christ, he, he banks on it. And... Jesus has to painfully show him that his, Peter's love, his commitment, his devotion to Jesus is weak and it will fail him if he banks on it. And Peter fails and miserable as he is, disqualified as he thinks he is, it is the love of Jesus that requalifies him, that resurrects him, that restores him, that recommissions him, showing Three times the contrast between Peter's failure to love Jesus and Jesus' success in loving Peter. The whole gospel can be summed up there. And then you'd think, conversion has happened. Everything's hunky-dory from this point forward. Now my devotion to Christ is dependable. Not. Peter fails again. He blows it again. No wonder that Peter, in 1 Peter 1.4, rejoices that Christ's love is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Read. Go back and read 1 and 2 Peter, and, and read what he says about Jesus. I mean, when he wrote that, he must have had his shameful past in mind, constantly forgetting God's steadfast love while being upheld by that same steadfast love. It's unfathomable. Blows your mind. Constantly forgetting God's steadfast love for us while at the same time being upheld by God's steadfast love. Peter's just beside himself. Christ's love is imperishable, undefiled, unfading. And he says, essentially, from this point forward, we never, ever, 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 ever outgrow our need for God's grace. Ever. Peter knows it. Let me just conclude with this. Uh, there's a lot of talk these days about gospel-centeredness. It's actually very encouraging to me. A lot of preachers and pastors and churches are beginning to rediscover the fact, the ancient fact, that the gospel is just as much for Christians as it is for non-Christians. Okay, That the gospel is not simply synonymous with evangelism. That the gospel is God's good news announcement that in Christ it is finished. And that's an announcement that you and I need each and every day because we forget it and we drift toward our own means of salvation and self-righteousness and all those things. It is God's grace alone that confronts and confounds our sin. 
And so the church is beginning, the evangelical church around the country is beginning to rediscover this idea that the gospel is central to every sermon that is preached, to every ministry that is conducted. But not everything that comes in the name of gospel centrality is. And so we need to be very Berean-like in our evaluation of what is and what is not gospel-centered. What is and what is not driven by this good news. And so here's something I wrote down this week. It's a good litmus test that will help us discern. Whether it's a sermon, a book, a blog post, or a tweet, okay, If the lasting impression you get causes you to focus more on what you must do than on what Christ has done, the gospel has not been communicated, and the communicator, albeit unwittingly, is no better than the Pharisees who were charged by Jesus with tying up heavy burdens hard to bear and laying them on people's shoulders. Yeah, I'm going to say that again. This is what I want. When you walk out of here on Sunday mornings, I don't want you walking out going, I've got so much to do. Okay? I don't want you doing that. I want you walking out on Sunday mornings, looking up and going, thank you for all you've done. Okay? Big difference. Huge difference. Every sermon that is preached, you listen to it, okay? Go on TV, especially see it there. Go on TV. Okay, listen on the radio, whatever. Use this as your evaluator when you listen to a sermon. Is the lasting impression something I must do so that I can somehow, some way, have my best life now? Or is the lasting impression what Christ has done? Okay, what, what, what's the feeling, the gut feeling you get? Is it... Thank God for Jesus, or I better get busy if God's going to be impressed with me and love me. It is through the preaching of the gospel that Jesus summons sinners, both Christians and non-Christians, and says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Compare the two. Matthew 23, 4, Jesus charges the Pharisees with tying up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and laying them on people's shoulders. And in Matthew eleven twenty eight and 29, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The difference between religion and the gospel is that religion gives burdens by announcing that Jesus plus something equals everything, while the gospel absorbs burdens announcing that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That's the difference. And so, rejoice, be glad if you are in Christ, it is finished. We can spend now the rest of our lives devoted to Jesus, not because our love for him is strong, but because his love for us is strong. We are now free to give everything away because everything we need in Christ we already have. It's not about us. It's about him. So I hope that over the course of this summer, you will learn To love, lean on, and rest in Christ's, it is finished. His burden is like he's done the work for us. That's what he means in Matthew 11. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. I've already done it. Just hang out with me. It's a done deal. That's it.